Okay, so I think just to make sure we keep to our time, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Alexandra Tarantino, and I'm a board member and chair of the Education Committee for Preservation Delaware. Uh, today, we're excited to kick off Preservation and Progress, Preservation Delaware's annual meeting and conference. Um, and we actually received a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, so we'd like to extend our thanks to the National Trust for that. So this morning, we have welcome messages from Mike McGrath, President of Preservation Delaware, and Tim Slavin, the Director of Delaware's Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs and the State Historic Preservation Officer. At 1045, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Kathy Rodriguez, of the City of San Antonio's Office of Historic Preservation. Um, and this afternoon, just as a little plug, we'll have our first session, which is called Flipping the Paradigm, Preservation as the Foundation for Sustainable Economic Growth, which I'll actually be moderating. And so that'll be from 1 to 2.30. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And we'd love to see you there if you can make it. Um, and just a few reminders before we begin, all attendees are muted automatically and cannot be seen. So if you do have a question, um, we ask that you please use the Q&A function sort of at the bottom of your screen that you can see. And when it's time to take questions, uh, I'll read any of those questions aloud for everyone to hear and for our speakers to answer. And lastly, we're recording these presentations and they'll be available in a few weeks at our website, preservationde.org, if you'd like to um, check in, rewatch, or if somebody um, you know would like to see them, they'll be there. So thank you all for attending and please welcome Mike McGrath. Thanks, Alex. I am Michael McGrath, President of Preservation Delaware Incorporated, and I want to welcome each of you online today to this new venture for PDI, three days we are calling Preservation and Progress. It is our annual meeting as a series of online conferences culminating in our annual business meeting on Saturday afternoon. If you have not already, please look over the other conferences we offer free of charge and featured at our website, preservationde.org. Again, that's preservationde.org. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Alex and her team on our education committee with Michael Emmons and Wade Katz and our executive director, Jay McCutcheon, for their groundbreaking work to put together this unique three days. Bravo, guys. PDI is Delaware's statewide organization focused on protecting, preserving, and advocating for the buildings, the archaeological sites, the stories that make up our shared history. We cover every part of Delaware's history and landscapes and daily are, as I like to say, standing up for what's being torn down. And we believe too that protecting the history of Delaware is crucial to our state's future, our quality of life, and our economic prosperity. Preservation of our historical resources is not just rooted in the past, it is helping us progress into the future. Why not join us? Not only will your membership help us financially in our efforts, but will add your voice to many others who care about Delaware's history as we urge the protection of our threatened historical resources. Again, go to preservationde.org and join us or make a donation that will help us keep important conferences like these and more we are planning in 2021 free. Now, let me introduce someone at the forefront of Delaware's caring for our history, Tim Slavin. Tim is director of Delaware's Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. Tim has been director for more than 15 years and has overall responsibility for the management of 41 historic properties, 119 structures, more than 750 acres of public land. He serves as the, our state historic preservation officer, our SHPO, with review and oversight authority on more than 600 annual federal undertakings, the issuance of $5 million in state historic preservation tax credits. He's also responsible for the stewardship of Delaware's antiquities collection that comprises 90,000 historical artifacts and more than 1 million archeological objects. He oversees a staff of 91 employees. But beyond his job, Tim Slavin has served for many years on the Dover City Council with interests and responsibilities across many areas of his community. In that role, Tim exemplifies and combines what is so important about historic preservation. It's not just about the past, 
It's about our present and it's about our future as a community. It's my pleasure to introduce a great friend and colleague of PDI's, Tim Slavin. Well, thank you for that introduction, Mike. I really appreciate that. And um, let me begin, first of all, by saying uh, good morning and uh, uh, extending my thanks to Alex and the Education Committee and all of PDI, um, but not just for putting on this conference, uh, but for all of the conversations, the ideas, the collaboration, and the energy that I have witnessed coming from PDI in the past year. This has really been a wonderful thing to see our statewide advocacy reemerge and play the important and significant role that we know PDI can and should play. And so uh, thank you for your work. We really, really do appreciate that. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the work of my colleagues in the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. Mike's introduction made it sound like I do everything. And in fact, I don't do a whole lot of anything <laughs> other than um, I make, uh, I, I hopefully make, uh, help to make an environment where, where we all succeed in preserving the significant and key cultural and historic resources that we have in Delaware. In particular, my colleagues in the State Historic Preservation Office, if I could, I, I, you'll, you'll hear from some of the, my colleagues in the course of the conference, but Alice Garant, Carlton Hall, Gwen Davis, Jennifer Anderson Reno, John Martin, Tara Briggs, Madeline Dunn, and Stephanie Soder. Uh, if you don't know these people, I would encourage you to find them out and meet them and work with them and collaborate with them. They are truly uh, wonderful colleagues to have. I consider myself uh, really blessed at this time in my career to have such a team uh, to work with and collaborate with. And I am very, very grateful for their work. Quite simply, they're people who wake up every day and kind of do the next right thing. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a great thing to, to come to work to and, and, and to work with people like that. I want to take a moment to um, address the dialogue around race and equity, which we've seen in so many of our communities and throughout our country uh, in the past in the past seven to eight months. Um, at the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, those issues, those race and equity issues have rightfully taken first chair in our concerns. Uh, we issued a statement in June on racial injustice. Um, and I would like to take a moment to read that statement, if I could. We support the elimination of racial injustice, racism, discrimination, and exclusionary history. We believe that Black Lives Matter. We strive to practice inclusive history. History is not a series of one-sided, happy stories. It is the combination of uncomfortable truths, differing perspectives, and difficult narratives. At the John Dickinson Plantation in Dover, for example, we tell the story of the enslaved, indentured, and free Black men, women, and children who worked and died on the plantation. We welcome the difficult conversations that come from interpreting the land of a founding father who wrote of freedom and liberty for all while holding human beings in bondage. We struggle with how to tell Delaware's more troubling history. We are stewards of Delaware's history. This history includes stories of pain, courage, and defeat. We will not shrink from the pain of our shared history. We are listening. We want people to be heard and to know that we are listening. Your voices will give shape to how we collect, interpret, preserve and present history to the public. We need your help. We can't do this on our own. We want to be an active participant in the force for change in our communities. We are here. We will be undeterred in bringing forth diversity in our stories and we want all voices to be heard. We strive to be a safe place for difficult conversations and uncomfortable truths. We promise to preserve and share Delaware history commit to expanding the parameters of that history and preserve the history of this moment, this movement for current and future generations. I thought it would be important to read those words because those words are the byproduct of every single member of the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. We went through a compressed but thorough vetting of the language and every person uh, on staff was given an opportunity 
to contribute to that statement. And many of the many of the graphs that I saw and watched as this evolved over a short period of time uh, reflect that language. And I think it, it's just really very solid work. But that is also words on a page. And what we have set out to do is now to carry those words forward in our work. We have corrected some things which needed correction. And we know this will be an ongoing process. The most publicized of this was we removed the whipping post from public exhibition in Georgetown. This was a decision that was made by the Div Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs to loan the object to the Georgetown Historical Society where it was exhibited in a public square in, in Georgetown. That was a poor decision at the time. It was, a, it was a, a worse decision that we didn't take action before 2020 to remove that item. The item has been removed. The object it is a part of our historical collections. It will be used to interpret our history, but it did not warrant placing in a public place uh, at, this, at any time. We created an internal group within HCA on race and equity issues and how we could drive this dialogue and build capacity for this dialogue into our organization and how we could drive the change throughout the organization. Um, honestly, I put the call out for volunteers thinking if I got a dozen or 15 people, that would be a success measure. We had 27 volunteers and that the work of that group is looking at not just the historical interpretation and historic preservation issues, but also how we are recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce and how we are distributing our work financially, uh, where we pay for projects for capital improvements. How are we how are we distributing that work to ensure that we are reaching minority communities with uh, some of the economic power that we have in our budget? We've rededicated ourselves to telling difficult history. And at the John Dickinson Plantation, where my colleagues Gloria Henry and Bertie Lee and Annie Fenimore have done a wonderful job of telling the stories of other individuals other than the Dickinson family, we have really kind of doubled down on those efforts now. Annie Fenimore is working on a project to create a census of every name, every name of every person who ever lived, worked, or died on the plantation, and to ensure that those names are told with some degree of equity along with the Dickinson family names. We have created an advisory committee, which will hold its first meeting in the first week in December. The committee includes representatives from a broad range of, del of uh, cultural organizations, those including some in Delaware and some overseas. We have a representative from Preservation Delaware, Dr. Abdullah Mohammed, on that, uh, on that advisory committee. That advisory committee will serve as an opportunity for us to vet our ideas about how we interpret history there. It will be a listening post for new ideas and it will connect us to national and international communities in the fields of museum studies, archaeology, historic preservation, and ethnocultural studies. And perhaps most importantly, we recently were uh, accepted in membership, the John Dickinson Plantation was accepted in membership into the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, uh, which includes many such sites that are dealing with these very difficult and timely issues of how we present them. And we plan to tap into that wellspring of knowledge that is created there. We have partnered with others outside of HCA to address inequities in the historic preservation of sites, of, in particular of Black history in Delaware. We recently awarded contracts to the University of Delaware CHAD program to do a cultural resources survey of Black schools in Delaware. And we also awarded a contract to Preservation Delaware to undertake a project, which is a companion to the University of Delaware project, which will look at conducting oral histories and creating some of the social history behind those sites. Outside of SHPO, we are, look, we are working um, in dialogue with the University of Delaware's anti-racism initiative now to ensure that we understand a full and complete history of our own property holdings throughout Delaware of the many properties that we have to make sure that we're aware of what that history is. 
I mention all of this because I believe the lens with which we view our own profession it has changed in the past few months. It will continue to change, and quite honestly, it needs to change. I want to read for you a quote from the National Park Service about diversity issues within historic preservation. And the quote is that despite a great deal of talk about diversity and some successful programs, preservation's core institutions remain largely unchanged. The profession continues to regard minority perspectives and issues as exceptional for special cases. Basic preservation work remains relatively untouched. I agree with the content of the quote, but what I find most alarming was that quote was issued in 2004. And I think we all can take a moment to look at how far the needle has been has moved from 2004 to present day on those very issues and how we can commit ourselves to continuing progress in this area. I believe we need to widen our lens. We need to really recast what we are looking at in historic preservation. We need to listen to new voices. And most importantly, we really need to cultivate our next generation of preservationists with this perspective. We shouldn't be afraid to tell, as we are fond of calling it, the difficult history that sometimes um, comes into our, our world. Speaking for our work at Historical and Cultural Affairs, we know that we have so very far to go. We have made many mistakes in the past, but we approach this topic and we approach this work with humility and we look forward to engaging with the community in this. I would also like to take a moment to say that as we see the emergence of PDI as our advocacy organization, something which I am personally thrilled with, because as I mentioned previously, we do need that partnership. All too often, advocacy can drift into uh, a series of events that where we oppose things that are being proposed, right? Where we look like we are antagonists to others. And I would encourage us to think about the successes that we have seen in historic preservation and to ensure that we tell the story of our successes. Mike McGrath mentioned earlier the State Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. For the asking, we have untold number of projects that have benefited, residential and commercial projects that have benefited from that Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program in Delaware that can show the success of historic preservation in our community. And I think we need to, to tell that story. I'll close where I started, and that is by uh, thanking again Alex and all the people at PDI, the board, for all of their hard work on this. Uh, it is really kind of wonderful to, to think that we have a statewide conference going on uh, in spite of a pandemic that we, we, met, we figured out a way to do this, that PDI is leading that charge. And so you have my thanks and my congratulations, and here's to a good conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, we just have, I'll do this very quickly. I know, I know you said you had to um, go, but we do have a couple of questions. Um, the statement that you read, um, an attendee is wondering if that's posted on your website or is available um, for them to read. It is posted on our website. I believe um, if people want to contact me, I can point them to that or I can, I can send a link to PDI and if you want to post it to, to, the, to the attendees. Okay, great, that sounds good. Okay, great. Um, and then the other one quickly, um, I think uh, they are looking for an update on the status of the Nassau School in Belltown um, and some more information about the other DuPont schools um, in the area. And I, I know you mentioned there's ongoing work um, to survey those. Um, and I didn't know if you had anything else to add for that. Sure, the cultural resources survey that UD, uh, uh, University of Delaware's CHAD program is doing will address, uh, look at all of the black schools, DuPont schools, as well as other schools that were, that served the, the black community and give us a status on what is extant and, and uh, what still remains. On the Nassau School in, uh, in Belltown near Lewis, this property is currently owned by Dot. We have a handshake agreement that that property will be transferred to the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. We're waiting to execute the uh, legal documents for that. We at Historical and Cultural Affairs have engaged with the um, Greater Lewis Foundation 
to begin kind of a charrette style approach with the local community about the adaptive reuse of that property. And I think the last part of that question is the I can check on the status of the historic markers program. It's not something that's under my purview, but it's a sister agency at the Delaware Public Archives, and uh, we can check on the status of that. Awesome, Tim. Well, thank you so much again. We really appreciate you taking the time out um, to help us uh, kick off the virtual conference. Thank you. All right. So um, next up, we have our keynote speaker, Kathy Rodriguez. So I just wanted to give a little introduction uh, for Kathy. Uh, Kathy is the Deputy Historic Preservation Officer for the City of San Antonio, responsible for the Vacant Building, Living Heritage, and Heritage Education programs. Since joining OHP in June 2013, she has managed several programs, including design review, code enforcement, and the City's Comprehensive Survey and Designation in Initiative. She's focused on assisting communities through change, um, and she has 13 years of public administration experience leading design review, historic preservation, and other programs focused on neighborhood revitalization. She has led a variety of community engagement programs and seeks an innovative methods aimed to reaching diverse audiences to build public participation. Kathy has also served on the City of San Antonio's Historic and Design Review Commission, the Building Standards Board, and she currently serves on the board of Preservation, Te Preservation Texas. Excuse me. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Texas at San Antonio and has completed graduate studies in historic preservation and public administration. So without further ado, Kathy, uh, thanks so much for joining us and take it away. Thank you, Alex. And uh, I just want to tell you, um, Mike, you know, you, you said some really great things about preservation. I think you must have taken a glimpse at my notes because you stole a little bit of my thunder, but that's good. That means that we're all really of one mind um, and we all have um, the same mission and vision and we're all working together to get there. And Tim, I also wanted to thank you for your statements um, and, and your comments. Um, I'll, you know, uh, from a personal side, I'll say that, um, you know, I'm the mother of three young men. And this summer, you know, the pain and, and the trauma that a lot of our cities faced um, you know, they, they bore witness to that. Um, and what makes that even more complex for us and our family is I'm the wife of a law enforcement officer. So, uh, you know, it's a very difficult summer for everyone. Um, but I think that it um, is going to have a, a huge impact because it's already just judging by the statement that you just said is really um, having uh, influence on everything that we do as a people. And so it's a really important time, especially in preservation, that we broaden our scope and that we open our processes and our, and our visions to include everyone. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and jump into the presentation. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. There we go. How does that, does that look good for everyone? Awesome. So again, just good morning to everyone and thank you to Preservation Delaware for inviting me to be with you all today. Um, I took a, a quick look, glimpse at the website of Preservation Delaware and um, I see that they are achieving preservation through education, uh, public policy and technical assistance. Um, those are strong foundations and we are also doing some of that same work in San Antonio. Um, I've been working uh, in local government, actually now it's been almost 14 years and eight of those I've been with the Office of Historic Preservation. Um, I actually started in the office back in about 2005-2006 and uh, part of the things I'll talk about in my presentation is really how the preservation movement has changed and has evolved. Uh, and more importantly, the face of preservation is changing. And I'm one of those faces that when I first started and I was attending conferences, I, I was not finding people that shared the same heritage that I did. Um, and now that has changed significantly. And so that's an important thing to note. Um, 
Our organization has a strong foundation and great programs in place. Um, we, we always welcome opportunities to share that. And so I'm, I'm happy to share that with you all today. And also we love following other cities and communities to see what they are doing. Um, we can learn so much from each other. And the good news of the pandemic is that distance and miles don't matter anymore. We can connect very easily. And um, that, that's something that I think we should um, we should take advantage of, and I hope that we can get together with Delaware and have some coffee uh, maybe next week. So why do we preserve? I think that a majority of the audience probably already understands why it's important. Um, for OHP, our purpose is to safeguard the cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability that preserves San Antonio's unique sense of place. Um, economic, economic competitiveness and our authenticity. I, I know I don't have to sell the group on this, but it's true that in some cases we do. When asked what is the biggest challenge in historic preservation, my answer is perceptions. And that was my same answer in my interview when I started almost 15 years ago. I'd like to highlight a couple of um, the reasons we preserve in San Antonio. Uh, we wanna help communities to be um, to be involved in decisions that are affecting the future in their communities. It's important that we leverage um, living heritage for economic prosperity and managing change through proactive measures to deal with the pressures of development that we know will come. In general, we know that historic preservation is about cultural sustainability. We have a huge tourism industry in San Antonio, which was greatly impacted by the pandemic. I believe the numbers that were noted before the pandemic is about 140,000 uh, jobs were created through the heritage industry and 15 billion uh, in revenue collected. And we took an enormous hit this year, which has really kind of affected uh, city programs. Uh, when you think about the um, impact of the hot tax, the hotel occupancy tax um, that fell extremely short this year. And economic sustainability, so consistent in San Antonio, our, our housing market has been consistent. Prices do rise in some neighborhoods, um, but uh, for the most part, even through uh, economic downturns, we've been pretty stable. And so it's really become important, we understand, that we need to conserve our existing housing stock. Um, the city has entered into um, some initiatives this past year to address the gap in affordable housing. We worked with Place Economics to create a study of existing housing stock in San Antonio. The study is called Opportunity at Risk. And we understand that uh, there's a significant amount of housing stock pre-1960 that could be utilized to fill that gap of affordable housing. And so we're trying to keep eye on that as we're working through programs and uh, developing new ideas. Uh, and of course, environmental sustainability, it's important to conserve our existing housing stock because they do embody um, uh, energy that is put into their, um, their existence. And uh, repairing that infrastructure and maintaining our existing housing stock is important. It's good for the environment, it's good for people, and it's good for our economy. None of these are really new topics um, and reflect the values of San Antonio's um, people, and that has been something that has um, really aided to the level of preservation that we, that we do now. Um, in another slide, I'll mention how even the structure of our department was greatly influenced by community. <clears throat> so a little bit about us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is a picture of Katie. Katie is one of our historic preservation specialists and she works at the counter. So she's the first person that individuals would encounter as they come in uh, to request a permit or to request a C of A. Katie has been with the office about five years and um, one of the reasons that she has um, been so well liked by all of our customers is that she does take great pride in her work and she believes that people are at the center of everything that we do. And that really comes across uh, to the customers. And that is just an example of the overall ethic of everyone who works for the office. Um, I do recall years back that um, it, it almost seemed that we were always just talking about the structure and the resource. 
And now we have broader conversations. So we talk about the structure and the resource, the people associated with it, as well as the fabric of the neighborhood in which it exists. And we also talk about the individuals who may have contributed to the development of it, not just the developer and the architect, but who are the tradespeople who applied their talents and skills to making this resource what it is today. Katie's just one of um, our staff. We have 20 all together. We do have a diverse group um, that brings a variety of specializations, educational backgrounds and experiences. And we're all committed to being responsive to the needs of the communities. And most importantly, we know we need to be flexible and we need to adapt always to those needs. Our growing staff, new programs, and basically the way we are structured in the city, as I mentioned, was mostly brought about through community. Um, the Office of Historic Preservation used to be a division of the planning department. And back in 2008, the office was removed from the planning department and became an independent department that answered directly to the city manager's office. Um, also something that changed over the years in our department is we do have a cultural historian that also came about from a call and a need from the community. So we have several program areas, um, five to be exact, which are focused on people and places and how they evolve through time. We think about them in terms of yesterday, today, as well as tomorrow. Although our enforcement jurisdiction is restricted to locally designated properties because designated properties have a zoning overlay to them, the work of our programs is not limited to designated properties. For example, we review every demolition request that comes through the Development Services Office, and that's regardless of age. So that's every request for every property within the city limits. Um, we are able to take 30 days to review those. And we've also developed ways to um, connect with community when we receive a demo request that we think may be of importance to the community. We strive to be innovative in our processes and our practices. Um, generally, preservation starts um, with the community first, and it works better when it's the community who is using the tool of preservation. Um, after designation, our offers, offers, efforts and programs are focused on providing the resources that encourage and enable the long-term life of the resources. So these are our five program areas. And some of them look familiar, <clears throat> very similar to other preservation offices, for example, design review, um, archaeology. So we do have two city archaeologists on staff. We do a significant amount of education and, and uh, outreach, which I'll talk a little bit more about that. And something a little unique is we do have the vacant building program housed in OHP. Typically, you'll find that in code enforcement or development related departments. Um, but there's a reason that it's an OHP, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Scout SA is our um, survey and designation uh, program. And Living Heritage is uh, something new that was established in 2015. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But to give you an idea how these fit into the framework of codes and our municipal codes, so design review in the vacant building program, as well as some parts of archaeology, those are all programs that are mandated by city code. Scout SA, a lot of that work is citywide. Of course, the idea is to identify potential um, sites and districts for designation. Living Heritage and our education and outreach, um, that is citywide and is not necessarily focused on designated structures. So public participation. Knowing that local designation is the best tool for preserving resources, we need, to we need that followed by um, meaningful participation for it to be successful. The process needs to be accessible. It needs to increase understanding and assist with participation, which we do, we strive to do that. Designation criteria needs to include places of cultural significance, which our ordinances do allow that. And we need to encourage any community, community member with a passion to apply for seats for boards and commissions. <clears throat> Desig <clears throat> Excuse me. Designation is um, an effective tool for preserving historic resources. Um, design review is a public particip participatory pro pro 
program that um, in years past um, was not something that was really followed by the community. One thing I've observed probably in the last seven years is that our neighborhoods and our residents have become very savvy and they're very much plugged into information. They follow agendas and they show up to meetings. But there are some neighborhoods who haven't quite uh, been able to organize and establish that process on their own. And so we've developed some programs to kind of help with that. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. <clears throat> Design review can be scary. Um, we have 32 local historic districts and over 1600 local landmarks. <clears throat> but the truth is, is that 98% of our applications are approved. <clears throat> Most people don't realize that. And it can be sometimes the hesitation of a community to become a historic district is the idea of having to stand before a commission to ask for a modification to a property that they own. Uh, you might know in Texas, we are a strong, strong property rights state. And so that is a, a strong mindset and it's something that most people keep in mind when designation is something that's being discussed. But to, um, to, to get over some of the hurdles of being able to access or participate in design review, we have made sure that we include translation, translation services, um, not only at the public hearings, um, but also all of our materials are translated in Spanish. Um, and we also provide that one-on-one -on -one assistance for a property owner who might request that. We also have a program established to provide design assistance um, a lot of these are single family residents. Um, some of them are elderly um, who really struggle with trying to commu communicate what it is they're proposing. And so we've designed some programs in place to help them with that. We've also um, worked on improving the agenda so that many people can participate, attend and listen. And so we've begun to have a portion of our agenda that is time certain. And we like to utilize that when we're talking about designations because we want folks to be able to participate. We try to make it outside of business hours um, and again, making it time certain so everyone can um, um, arrange their day to be able to attend. We also work with um, our historic districts to develop district specific guidelines. And currently we're talking about how, how those can evolve and they may not look like traditional design guidelines. For example, if we designate a district that is based mostly on the criteria for cultural significance, then the design guidelines, the way we treat the physical may be different than a district that has um, a great collection of tree style bungalows. And so we're trying to work with communities to develop good statements um, that talk about what those values are, what is important and what they feel should be preserved. And hopefully that that will um, inform district specific guidelines that could be developed for them. Um, the photo that you see here is a shotgun type house in the west side of San Antonio, very common vernacular. Last year we started an initiative, the shotgun house initiative, which the goal of that is to raise awareness of this building type that was traditionally used to serve as affordable housing. We, um, as I mentioned, we're experiencing a gap in affordable housing units and we'd like to build awareness for this type to again be used for that purpose. Um, to date, we've identified about 300 um, of those vernacular shotgun type houses. And um, one positive outcome of the initiative to date is that one of our council offices has actually um, decided to partner with us to rehabilitate three of the houses that are on our inventory and located on the west side of San Antonio and that we make them available for affordable housing. And what's important about this particular project also is that we hope to develop a how-to guide so that more of these types of re rehabilitations can be done. In some cases, it's going to require creative funding. Uh, some of them are vacant and wouldn't normally qualify for the owner-occupied rehab program. Um, and so we are going to have to be creative on how we fund the rehabs and also making sure that the um, unit is available at an affordable rate. The other thing that we will be documenting and keeping an eye on is those unintended consequences. Um, for example, if I have a vacant structure and I provide assistance for them to rehab that structure, 
but in turn, what they do is just increase the rate of the rent so that no one can afford to live there anymore, or the previous tenant can no longer afford to live there anymore. So that would be an unintended consequence of our project. So we're going to be following those types of um, circumstances and make sure that we can put um, things in place, policy or agreements in place to be able to safeguard our, prop our property owners and our tenants. So the problem. So there are many communities that want protection uh, from incompatible development and preserve preservation of their neighborhoods, but the traditional tools of preservation don't offer the resources needed. So designation of culturally significant properties, which is not difficult in San Antonio because our 16 criteria um, does cover cultural significance as well. Um, actually seven of the 16 uh, do highlight that. Um, so this has led to cases that have been difficult for communities, the Historic Design Review Commission and the Office of Historic Preservation. Um, we can designate places of cultural significance, but then the question is always, how do we treat it? So um, again, talking about um, providing access to this process of designation and the process of design review will help. Um, making sure that we are collecting oral histories and um, documentation from the community to make sure that we're pinpointing what it is that is significant about that site and making sure that that is something that we're safeguarding through our other processes after designation. So better processes, I actually think that's, that's a huge theme for this year, um, improving our processes. So one of the things that uh, we have worked really hard to do <clears throat> Can I drink some water? So, um, so our city codes do mandate notification for some of the processes and some of the requests we get. But what we've done is we've elected to do more notification um, to loop neighborhood associations and communities into um, other processes and initiatives that are happening. So we have improved our coordination with the Development Services Department. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are uh, part of the design review, I'm sorry, the demolition review process that they oversee. And so what we've begun to do is if we see a structure come through that is being proposed for demolition, we send a courtesy notice to the neighborhood association and some other organizations who have elected to be on this distribution list to see if they can, um, within the community, reach out to the property owner and talk about some alternatives or maybe understand what their challenges are to keeping the structure and maybe working that out together at the community level. Um, the other thing that we've done is, um, in this photo, we developed the Mission Historic District Design Manual. So those are district-specific guidelines. And through that process, um, we used a couple of new ways to engage and to get feedback from the community. Uh, we did uh, visual preference surveys, so individuals were able to look at um, kind of do you want this or do you want that kind of scenario, so we were getting feedback from them in that way. And also there's a section in this design manual that really just focused on the culture within the uh, Mission Historic District. Um, that is the largest historic district um, in San Antonio, I believe it's about six uh, linear miles. It, um, it's right along the San Antonio River, but it has a very different development pattern through the different segments of the district. And so we wanted to um, have a resource for anyone who's uh, building or developing or rehabbing in the district so that they could really understand the culture and the development over time and how people impacted that and how people could be influenced by their proposed projects. So this is an interesting statement um, that was collected. So we host a uh, Living Heritage Symposium every year. And uh, this is one of the uh, quotes that we learned from the symposium. When people connect to issues through personal stories, they see them in a different way. They don't just see democracy in the abstract, they see my democracy. And so again, that's really um, drives home um, the philosophy and the importance of um, engaging with the community and having the vision for the preservation or the success, defining what the success of a project is, is coming from our communities. 
So the Living, Living Heritage uh, Program was established January of 2015. Um, this was in the response to the loss of, a, um, of the Univision building in San Antonio, which was the first Spanish language um, television station, uh, I believe in the nation. Yes, and it was in San Antonio. Um, the, in a response to this, this is where we were um, asked by, by community to develop a cultural historian uh, position for the department and that's when that began and part of bringing on the cultural historian who is uh, her name is Claudia Guerra was to initiate um, or launch the Living Heritage Program and you know this was intended to identify the tangible and intangible that's important to San Antonio uh, to making sure that we are preserving not only the structures but those things the intangible uh, the values of our community and people that make our places authentic and unique. Under Living Heritage, we have a few programs um, and I'll mention that these primarily are citywide, uh, don't necessarily work with structures that are already designated. Um, so this is a way that we're able to engage with all communities, even those who have not elected to be historic districts. Um, we have cultural heritage districts, which is primarily um, an honorary program, but what it helps us do is to identify and to build awareness of particular parts of towns that uh, um, embody um, our heritage. The Office of Historic Preservation also participates in the review of all public infrastructure projects um, and all city owned properties. And so this really helps us when we're reviewing street, sidewalk, and other infrastructure projects because we know that this is a special place. And it also helps our public works department um, as they are also engaging with property owners. They know that um, they need to do more engagement in these areas and need to better understand the impact of our proposed projects. Currently, we have two cultural heritage districts and the Shotgun House Initiative that I mentioned earlier we hope to have a non-contiguous district um, where we would um, include some of the shotguns that we've identified as a cultural heritage district. Um, we also began an annual symposium, which is now going to be every two years, the Living Heritage Symposium. So this, this was born out of our attending um, many conferences and for the past several years, cultural heritage and cultural significance has been a very big topic. And we were learning a lot about what we and other communities were facing in, in this regard, but we weren't really hearing what the tools were that were being developed. I think we were all just trying to figure this out at the same time. And so we decided that the symposium would be focused on bringing people together for the purpose of coming up with some policy recommendations. You know, what are some tools that we should be implementing? And this has been a, um, a global symposium and many of our presenters are from other countries uh, throughout the world. And so we've really learned some unique um, examples from, um, from other countries. And uh, we walk away with a report that talks about, talks about some of the recommendations that were made and um, captures the discussion at the symposium. Uh, with the pandemic, of course, uh, we're not able to meet like we, we tr traditionally would. So we're in the, in the middle of planning a virtual symposium that will be in 2021. So please um, find our website, get on our email distribution list so we can keep you up to date on that planning. So under Living Heritage, we also established the Legacy Business Program. We were finding that there were many businesses that were iconic. Um, they were part of the shared memory of a lot of our residents in San Antonio. And it was when we were faced with the loss of one in particular that we understood that we needed to develop a program where we could support those legacy businesses, identify them, support them, and connect them with resources. And this became paramount as we entered into the pandemic. Um, we knew that a lot of these mom and pops and legacy businesses were going to be most vulnerable uh, when businesses were asked to be closed when the pandemic was reaching its height. Um, and so what we did um, this year, we were not able to do a lot of the face to face engagement that we normally do. So we focused on trying to um, find other ways to support our communities and our businesses 
And so throughout the pandemic, we uh, reached out to all our legacy businesses. We made sure we connected them with our economic development department and that they were aware of any assistance um, that was being offered in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, legacy businesses uh, typically have been in existence for 20 years. There's a criteria. They don't necessarily have to be in an historic district or a historic building. They may not even own your building. But if they promote in some way to the heritage and the authenticity of San Antonio, then they could be eligible. Um, being eligible can also make them eligible for other city programs and incentives. For example, in the World Heritage um, Buffer Zone, if you are a legacy business and you're located within the World Heritage Buffer Zone, then you could be eligible for a grant. Um, I believe that program is being impacted this year because of our um, um, pandemic and the short um, shortfall in our revenues, but uh, we hope that that's something that will come back. Another program offered in OHP is the vacant building program. Uh, a lot of people think that we only uh, focus on historic buildings and historic districts, but the vacant building program is actually uh, beyond designated properties. Uh, it covers 112 square miles of the city of San Antonio, which includes about 116,000 parcels. The uh, vacant building program area is in historic districts, but it's also um, neighborhood conservation districts, TERS areas, uh, buffer zones around those areas, as well as a buffer zone around our active military bases. So the vacant building program, most people would um, associate that with being a code enforcement program. And this program does have teeth. Um, it does have provisions in the ordinance where we have someone who's not in compliance, we can take them to municipal court. But that's not how we measure success for this program. Success for the program is helping these property owners find long-term solutions for vacancy. That's why the team that works in the vacant building program are not code officers. We have case managers um, who spend a lot of time working with the property owners and neighborhood associations um, to uh, make successes. And to us, a success is a building that's no longer subject to the ordinance, no longer vacant. It meets the minimum standard of care. Um, if it wants to be vacant, the ordinance does allow for that. It just needs to be registered annually and they need to submit to an inspection annually and it does need to meet a minimum standard of care. Basically, it just needs to look habitable. So what are we preserving next? So that, that's always the question. Um, in San Antonio, we are just coming out of the decade of downtown. Uh, we have a World Heritage site, um, a site, multiple sites, one in our urban core and then south of the downtown. But we are having, you know, we are adapting to the current and the post pandemic world. Um, for the city of San Antonio, one of the pillars of recovery is workforce development. And we are focused in being mindful of equity and inclusion in everything that we do. So we are also engaged in climate heritage. So we're still preserving historic sites, but the scope and the narrative is much greater than it was in the past. This is a photo that was taken at one of our neighborhood workshops. We partnered with some community partners to develop workshops to help neighborhoods that were being affected by change and development to help them and give them the tools to be able to engage with developers and to have very good conversations and understanding the terminology being used so that they can be at the table when these decisions are being made. In this case right here, you see an activity which is a role playing. And so one of the persons at the table is playing the role of the developer and the others are the neighborhood. And so we gave them some terminology, we gave them some um, vocabulary at the beginning of the session, and now they're entering into a discussion talking about density, intensity, lot coverage, setbacks. And so we're, we're helping the neighborhoods um, learn how to engage in a conversation and how to articulate what they want instead of just saying, you know, it's too big. Um, and so, or, you know, it, it, it just doesn't fit. Uh, within the community. So this was one of the things that we did. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but through this same um, effort, we actually developed a development related process board game called Plots and Flats. So it's kind of like Shoots and Ladders, 
And what it does is it, it, um, it, it shows everyone what our review process is, shows them where they can engage and how, shows them, um, even if you're a developer playing the game, it helps you understand when to engage with community and when it can help you through the review process if you've actually done that and you have support from community. Um, that's a whole nother session right there, but it was tons of fun. People were laughing and, and just having a good time while they were learning about the de development review process. This is a photo of uh, just one of our hands-on service learning opportunities. So this is rehab -Arama. So rehab -Arama is an event that we've been doing annually. We took a pause this year. We had to change the date, but it'll happen again this year. And basically it's a rehabilitation block party. So in this particular photo, we were out in one day on a Saturday. We rehabbed 18 houses. We had 300 volunteers and 13 contractors leading the projects and all, and all in one day. Um, we have a lot of support from community. Um, I have to preface all of this with, we really don't have a budget for um, outreach and engagement. Um, we do have a little money, so if there is a demolition of a landmark, there is a fee that has to be paid, and that fee goes into the Academy account so that we're able to use that to build awareness about preservation. But we really don't have money for tools and supplies and um, uh, even promotional materials. And so we have a lot of sponsors and contractors. Um, Whataburger, if you know Whataburger, is um, a big burger um, company that originated in San Antonio um, but just moved out of town. Um, but they provided lunch for our 300 volunteers. So it really is a community effort. Some people kind of equate it to a barn raising, but it's been a really great way for us to build awareness about these communities and to show that the building materials and methods that are used in our historic districts, they are valuable. They can be repaired. A little bit of elbow grease can save you from having to put in a, um, a Home Depot aluminum window if we could teach you how to rehab your historic wood windows. So heritage education for us is uh, important. And actually it was one of the things that I spearheaded when I started with the department. I thought it was very important that we be engaging with grade school students and in particular in those neighborhoods um, and those students who normally wouldn't be exposed to ideas and careers in architecture, historic preservation or public service. And so we began the heritage education program in 2014. And today it has really grown. As a matter of fact, we have a memorandum of agreement with a local independent school district. Uh, the majority of those um, campuses are the core or the inner loop of 410 of San Antonio. And they've agreed to um, develop and incorporate a cultural heritage curriculum throughout all of their campuses as well as um, traditional trades in their trades program. And that's something that we're working with them right now. Um, it has been challenging with the pandemic because schools were closed and students are distance learning, uh, but we are still engaged with them and we are adapting what those processes are and what those projects are with students. The goal with the Heritage Education Program, of course, is to foster preservation ethic, to highlight community pride. A lot of these schools are in poor neighborhoods um, and we want them to know that their neighborhood and their culture is San Antonio and is something to be very proud of. Uh, we also like to introduce them to careers in preservation and public service, as well as architecture and archaeology. OHP also entered into a memorandum of understanding with a local university, UTSA, and uh, we offered a um, traditional trades um, experience for the capstone construction science students. And that's what you're seeing here. And so these students were able to apply what they've learned in their construction science and construction management courses, but in terms of a rehabilitation versus new construction. So they learned everything from scoping the project, um, site safety, and then those preferred methods for working with traditional materials and, um, and methods also gave them an opportunity to work side by side with our um, legacy and uh, master craftsmen. Um, the gentleman kneeling here is Victor Salas, uh, master craftsman, fifth generation craftsman, who uh, volunteered his time to work with the students and to help them understand the materials and how to restore them at this site. 
Um, the site actually belongs to a nonprofit, the Power of Preservation Foundation, and it is a learning lab. Uh, it was a vacant home that they acquired. And so the idea is that we use every opportunity to teach people about how to rehab and restore this particular site. Um, the students actually, in one case, had to reconstruct or rebuild a wood window. And one of the statements that we got from the students at the end of the class is that they understood the amount of energy, skill, and craft into assembling a wood window. And for that reason, they understood the importance of retaining those existing windows and repairing them. So this is the team. Um, this is us. So I'm one of 20. I believe there's 21 in this photo because we do have a Living Heritage Fellow that works with us. Um, you can see we're a very diverse group. Uh, some of us are local, some of us aren't, um, but we really enjoy uh, what we do. Um, we're not getting rich off of what we're doing. We do what we do because we have a passion um, and a general love for San Antonio and its culture. And it really drives what we do every single day. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, you'll see my um, email address is down there at the bottom. This is a lot of information. Please reach out to me if there's anything you want to learn more about. Um, keep in mind, also, our website is the same, essaypreservation.com. So um, you can check out our website and hopefully get signed up for our e-blast so you can be up to date on everything that we're doing. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was that was great. I mean, it, it just sounds like um, San Antonio sort of uses a combination of tools to, you know, make sure that preservation um, of of historic buildings, but also of cultural heritage is is um, is a priority. And that's that's really great. Um, I think I know we're running a little behind, but we do have a couple of questions that I think um, would be really great if if you could take a stab at answering them. So we actually had two or a couple three that um, came in about the designation, the cultural, the cultural significance designation. Um, so I would say maybe the first question would be, um, what is the process or what are the criteria for establishing a cultural heritage district? Um, and how, if at all, is integrity um, a, a factor in that designation? Is that used to evaluate those properties? So the criteria is not hard and fast. So um, since it is honorary, um, what we look for is uh, for the community to kind of help us define or describe what is important about that place. Um, and, and that's what makes it significant. So one of the existing um, cultural historic, historic just, I'm sorry, heritage districts is the historic Highway 90 corridor. So we're talking about a commercial corridor that was very much about the automobile. It was on the west side of town. It was near uh, one of uh, Blackland Air Force Base, which is one of our military bases. And so it served the military community as well as the neighborhoods. And um, of course, we have a new highway, Highway 90, and so it diverted traffic. So that began to impact the success of the businesses. Um, but a lot of them were able to stay in business uh, over the past you know, 30, 40 years. And that's really the story that that district tells and why it's important. Um, and it came about because they were gonna be doing some street improvements. And um, the folks living there were concerned about those changes and how it was gonna change um, the streetscape on Old Highway 90. And so that's how we began and that's how we made them a cultural heritage district. And we do have a policy that's written for that. So email me, whoever asked that question, and I'd be happy to share that with you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. So one other one. Um, how were you able to motivate businesses to become sponsors for your um, it was the, the renovation. Uh, the rehab -arama. Yeah. rehab -arama. Rehab -arama. <laughs> um, You know, I said earlier that, um, you know, we are successful in San Antonio in our preservation program, but it's not because we work magic. The magic really comes from the community. And so it is just part, it's ingrained in our culture and it's just part of our values um, to number one, step up and help each other. Um, and to preserve our districts. 
But I think also a lot of our sponsors understand that the economic um, stimulation that happens from Rehab Aroma. So I'll give you an example. When we have Rehab Aroma, I buy tacos from the taquerias that are close by. We buy ice from the stores that are nearby. So whenever there's rehab happening in an area, it's just good for business. Um, and so I think that there's a recognition of that. A lot of our sponsors are contractors, uh, realtors who are part of our rehabber club, and they understand that rehabbing properties isn't just good for the property owner, but it's good for the city. That's and you do have to knock on doors. You know, there is knocking on doors and asking, but a lot of them, once they do uh, become a sponsor, they come back every year. That's awesome. Let's see. Okay. Um, this is, this is a great question. I, I do think this would be really useful um, in all three counties of Delaware, maybe. So um, the question is, what is the fee for demolition and how is your office able to recapture that fee uh, to be put towards outreach um, or, you know, emergency documentation? Because um, I, I think particularly, so our Newcastle County, the northernmost county does have um, there is a demolition review process, but I think, you know, if, if they were able to put some of, if there's a fee and putting that towards outreach um, would probably be a really useful tool for, for really any county or, or local organization. Absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> the way the fee works is it's a minimum of $2,000 and this is only for designated property. So if you are a designated historic property, then you have a zoning overlay. And so when you walk in and you ask for your permit and we've reviewed it and the HDRC has given you approval, part of your permit fee is to pay the demolition cost, um, which is uh, a minimum of $2,000 or it's a buy um, per square foot cost. And then that goes into a revolving account because typically our general fund, you know, it, it, it starts fresh every year, but this is a revolving fund. So whatever's collected uh, carries over from year to year. Uh, one thing I'll also mention about our demolition process is um, if you're a designated property and you request demolition, you do have to go to the commission for that. At that time, you also have to show what your replacement plans are. So you're getting approval for both. And the city will not issue a demolition permit until you've shown proof of economic, you know, so that you have the funds to follow through with your project and we won't issue you a demolition permit until you have a building permit in hand. So you've gone through the entire process and you're actually ready to build. That is the only moment we'll give you the demolition permit because if your project falls through and the resource is gone, we can't bring it back. Thanks, that is that is great. I think that's you know definitely something that um, in Delaware, you know, the different counties should consider um, that sounds useful for sure. All right, so I think there was one last question. Um, I, they're asking if um, you can show the slide with the statement about living history through personal stories. I think that may have been the slide that when we talked, Kathy, that I really liked yeah. too. Um, and um, this is actually a, a PDI board member. So if, if that's okay with, with you, I can share that quote with him um, yes. separately too if he, if he needs it. Absolutely, because I'm having trouble finding it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you know, we I I believe very strong in the public participatory process. And oftentimes I think the outcome of that process is the best outcome. Um, but that's the hardest part is to get people to go through the process, whether it's the developer or the neighborhood. But once they do work together, we have found that the outcome is something that everyone can be happy with. Uh, they may not get everything they, they wanted uh, at the start of the dialogue, um, but they usually work through something that um, everyone feels uh, comfortable with. Um, because the truth is, is the change is going to happen. You know, the, the projects are going to come and change is going to happen. Um, the important part is for communities to participate. Absolutely. Well, Kathy, I want to thank you again. Um, this was really great. Uh, thank you for taking the time to put together your presentation and, and to coordinate with us um, and to be here with us today. I know um, I definitely learned a lot and I, I think everybody else did too.
Um, so just to kind of wrap up, I will say um, in the in the chat, I did post a chat to um, all of the participants. Uh, Tim provided me with the link to the statement that he read. Um, I think somebody requested to to see that so you can um, access it through that link. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think if you haven't already signed up for uh, the sessions over the next couple of days, please do. If you go to our website, they're all listed there. Um, the registration links are there as well. Um, I think, you know, if if you're interested in, in the topics that we discussed now that Kathy was able to sort of describe and give us examples um, about, I think you'll definitely be interested in this afternoon session on um, preservation and sustainable economic development. And I think you'll also be really interested in um, our fourth session on Saturday morning about inclusivity and diversity in Delaware's historic preservation programs and how we can better work to promote those things. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers and our attendees for, for tuning in this morning. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at some of the other events. Thanks so much.